Do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe that disembodied spirits can communicate with us from the afterlife? Do you believe that human souls can get caught somewhere between this world and whatever comes next? I don't, but if scientists suddenly had definitive proof of souls or spirits or an afterlife, I'd be totally on board. Excited about it even. Oh, I'm coming back to haunt you after you flush me. Flush you? I'm gonna batter and fry you. You sick son of a bitch. Now, even though I'm skeptical about the paranormal, I'm still interested. I love spooky stuff. I've been to the LaLori Mansion in New Orleans, which had a dark and brutal history, even before Nicolas Cage lived there. Oh. I've tried to summon Princess Tuscawanta, the broken-hearted lady of Lake Ronkonkoma, who has claimed the lives of 120 swimmers, all young men. I've even held a seance with Gene Simmons while chasing ghosts around the Queen Mary. Uh, now you're just making things up. I picture closing every show with a seance like this. Okay, I didn't see that coming. The Queen Mary really was super creepy, and you can check it out for yourself. You go down to Long Beach, California, and they will show you around. And we've got 10 more spooky places that you can actually visit coming up. Whether you're into ghosts or just like the darker side of history, this video is for you. Welcome to The Y Files, where high IQ folks like us come to laugh and learn. And if you're enjoying the content, do us a favor and hit the like button, which is kind of this shape, and the subscribe button, which is kind of like a red rectangle. Is that the shape? Hit those, they really help out the channel. Scariest places in the world. That's a list that's been done a million times. But the problem I have with those lists is they're inaccessible. The places are either closed to the public or a million miles away. I mean, there's no scarier place on Earth than La Isla de las Muñecas. Speak English, Madonna. Island of the Dolls. Gracias. But unless you live near Mexico City and can get special permission, YouTube is as close as you're gonna get. Instead, here's a list of the scariest places in the US open to the public right now. Some offer tours, some will let you wander around on your own, some will even let you spend the night. Now this list is just gonna cover the states, but for our Wi filers in the UK, there are lots of haunted places in your neck of the woods. So many that they need their own video. If you'd like us to do one, just request that in the comment section. Ecklefish, you ready? Dude, I've been ready since I was caviar. I'll take that as a yes. Eastern State Penitentiary. Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia was once the most famous prison in the world. Known for its grand architecture, and strict discipline. It was operational from 1829 until 1971 and was home to thousands of inmates, including big names like Al Capone and Willie Sutton. Considered to be one of the most haunted places in America, there have been reports of echoing voices, shadowy figures, ghostly faces, stories that have been corroborated by staff, guards, visitors, even other inmates while they were serving time. Its history makes it easy to imagine the spirits of troubled souls wandering the gloomy halls. It was the world's first actual penitentiary, a prison designed to inspire penitence or true regret in the hearts of the convicted. The mad chair bound a prisoner's limbs so tightly that circulation was cut off, requiring eventual amputation. The iron gag is where an inmate's hands were tied behind his back and an iron collar forced into his mouth so that any movement at all caused the tongue to rip and bleed, and in some cases just be torn right out of his face. The hole was an underground cell where prisoners had no light, no toilet, no exercise, no human contact, and barely enough food to stay alive. Solitary confinement was eventually phased out as the prison population grew. By 1926, there were over 1,700 inmates living three, sometimes four to a cell, cells designed to just hold one, in 1933, inmates rioted because of overcrowding, and they set fire to cells all over cell block 12, which is now a focal point of paranormal activity. People have heard cell doors opening and closing. Some say they can smell smoke. Others have even said they've seen shadowy figures walking through the catwalk. If you want to experience Eastern State for yourself, you can. They run day and night tours called Terror Behind the Walls. No, thank you. Link in the description below. Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, later known as Weston State Hospital, was a psychiatric hospital that operated from 1864 through 1994 in Weston, West Virginia. It comprises 13 buildings, 
on 666 acres of property. That doesn't sound like an accident. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum originally intended to be a place of peace and recuperation for the mentally ill, but it quickly devolved into a nightmare of abuse, suffering, and human atrocity. Designed to house 250 patients, the population eventually swelled to over 2,600 people. Rooms that were intended for one occupant often contained five or six people crammed together sleeping on the floor. To make matters worse, Trans-Allegheny began admitting the criminally insane and letting them mingle with the rest of the patient population. This was not a good idea. Violent patients that couldn't be controlled were locked in cages in the common areas as recently as the 80s. The 1880s? The 1980s. The 1980s? Ronald Reagan, MTV, and people in cages. What a decade. It's a man house! A man house! A 1938 report found that the hospital housed epileptics, alcoholics, drug addicts, and non-educable mental defectives. It sounds a lot like Hollywood. Oh, things get even more gruesome. Famous Dr. Walter Freeman set up shop here to perform experimental lobotomies. For his procedure, Dr. Freeman used the ice pick method. I'm afraid to ask. He slipped a metal rod into the patient's eye socket, then used a mallet to hammer the rod through the thin bone and sever the tissue in the prefrontal cortex. Over the course of his career, Dr. Freeman did over 4,000 lobotomies, sometimes leaving perfectly healthy patients with permanent brain damage. Still sounds like Hollywood. By the way, Dr. Freeman did this procedure without gloves, without anesthesia, without surgical training. Ooh, fah, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Oh, that old gem. <laughs> I got a million of them. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum was forced to close in 1994, and it's like the patients just vanished into thin air. Rooms still contain furniture, artwork, medical equipment. There's wheelchairs in the hallways. I don't know why that's extra scary, but it is. One of Trans-Allegheny's well-known ghosts is a little girl named Lily, who was born, lived, and died right there in the asylum and has haunted it ever since. It's been reported that Lily likes to hold visitors' hands and tug on their clothes. Some people have heard her giggling and playing in the hallway near her first floor room. Doors are often left open by Elizabeth, a nurse who doesn't know she's dead. Supposedly, she's still making her rounds. Other reported ghosts belong to patients who were brutally killed there or killed themselves, and there were lots of those. When you go to their rooms, reports say that the air gets cold and you can hear whispers or voices in your ear. In 2007, Trans-Allegheny opened to the public. They offer day, night, and overnight tours. The most frequent visitors are ghost hunters, but for anyone interested in the dark history of America, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum is a must-see. The Whaley House. The Whaley House in Old Town, San Diego has been called the most haunted house in America. It's been documented in books, magazines, TV for over a hundred years. If there are ghosts at the Whaley House, who are they and what do they want? In 1852, James Yankee Jim Robinson was convicted of larceny and hanged on the property. Present at the hanging was Thomas Whaley. He bought the property and built a house there. In 1857, he moved his family in, and that's where it all started. Thomas Whaley was successful in almost every venture he pursued until he built the Whaley House. After that, tragedy haunted him and his family for the rest of his life. Thomas's son, Thomas Jr., contracted scarlet fever when he was 18 months old and died shortly thereafter in 1858. A few months later, an arsonist set fire to Whaley's business. Despondent over these tragedies, the family moved to San Francisco briefly, but were forced back when an earthquake devastated their home. Out of money and out of options, Thomas Whaley went on the road and traveled the country looking for employment, unsuccessfully. Meanwhile, his family was back in San Diego in dire straits. Thomas Whaley's daughter, Violet, married and then divorced a local con man. Her humiliation caused her such despair that she took her own life in the Whaley house in 1885. She was only 22 years old. Thomas Whaley passed away from poor health in 1890. His wife Anna, his son Francis, his son George, and daughter Lillian all eventually died in the Whaley House. The house was converted into a museum in 1960, and immediately workers, staff, guests, visitors, all reported hearing voices, smelling cigars, smelling perfume, and seeing ghostly apparitions. Look, I'm just telling a story, believe it or don't. 
But in 1964, famous TV personality Regis Philbin went to film a local broadcast of the Whaley House, and he left there convinced that he saw the ghost of Anna Whaley. And years later, Regis went back to the house, still convinced. To his dying day, he always said, something is going on in this house. I trust Regis. I do too. I also trust the multiple police officers who over the course of 30 years witnessed a woman crying at the back of the house. And one officer kept quiet about this, but after he retired, he wrote that he also found a woman crying at the back of the house. He said she was dressed in period clothing. He asked her, ma'am, are you all right? She then looked at him and smiled. When he turned his flashlight on her, she disappeared. Was the woman Anna Whaley crying over the loss of her children? Or was it Violet crying because she regretted taking her own life? Well, there's a link below where how you can go visit the Whaley house and find out for yourself. Lake Shawnee Amusement Park. The Lake Shawnee Amusement Park is located in Princeton, West Virginia. West Virginia again, huh? Interesting. The park opened in 1926 to cater to the families of nearby coal workers, but all that remains is its skeleton, which is appropriate given its dark history. The land in which the park is built was home to a Native American tribe. When the Clay family attempted to settle the land in 1783, a turf war ensued which resulted in the brutal deaths of both natives and settlers alike, all buried on the site. Centuries later, a local businessman purchased the Clay property and built a swing set, Ferris wheel, and a swimming pond. And all three of those attractions would claim one child's life. Lake Shawnee eventually expanded into a full amusement park and was responsible for at least six deaths. It finally closed in 1966 However, all the structures, rides, and attractions, they're still standing, rusted and overgrown, and creepy as f On the property is a motorized swing machine, and many years ago, a little girl was killed climbing into one in a horrible way. Anyway, the current owner of the property says that even when there's no wind, he can still see those swings kind of moving and creaking. And when he gets close to that swing where the girl died, he feels a chill in the air and says he can hear whispers. Okay, fine, whispers, wind, no big deal. But the owner's son said that he's seen a vision of a little girl wearing a pretty dress covered in blood. Oh. Paranormal investigators have been all over this site because Lake Shawnee's been featured on all the Ghost Hunter TV shows and YouTube and everywhere. But you don't need press credentials or a Positron Collider to visit Lake Shawnee Amusement Park. It's open to the public day, night, and even for overnight camping. Flashlights are mandatory, but you might not like what you see. Good luck. The abandoned Cincinnati subway. Oh, I love this one. Now, early in the 20th century, Cincinnati was the 10th largest city in America. Trade was primarily conducted using a complicated canal system, which just couldn't keep up with demand. Many canals became filthy and had to be drained and refilled, which led to mosquitoes, which led to disease. It was a mess. A plan was made to build a 16 mile rail system, partially underground. Work began in 1920, but it was hit with all kinds of delays. Houses along the route were crumbling, foundations cracked, porches falling into holes in the earth, lawsuits, budget cuts, and city corruption crippled the project. Two miles of the underground tunnel were completed by 1929, but then the stock market crashed and the Great Depression hit and the project was put on the shelf. So you're saying the train project was derailed? Really? Puns? No, you're not giving me much to work with here. Fair enough. In 1962, at the height of the Cold War, the abandoned Liberty Street Station was converted into a community fallout shelter. Areas were designated as first aid rooms, kitchens, decontamination showers, even a morgue. Some of the equipment and furnishings are still down there. An open house was held for the citizens of Cincinnati who were not impressed. The tunnels kind of just sat there. They were officially decommissioned in 1991 and the entrances to the tunnels sealed. But not all entrances. Disclaimer time. Yes, you can get into the tunnels. No, you're technically not allowed to do that. You can request a tour, but the city rarely grants access. This hasn't stopped paranormal investigators or urban explorers from seeking out the hidden access points, which as of this video still exist. Links below. I'm in Vulture City. Wickenburg, Arizona is about 70 miles northwest of Phoenix and it's home to Vulture City, an abandoned ghost town that sits on top of Vulture Mine. And if there's a list of haunted places in America, Vulture Mine is always on it. In 1863, Austrian prospector Henry Wickenburg discovered a gold deposit that would become the most productive gold mine in Arizona history. 
By the 1880s, the settlement's population exploded, making it one of the most densely populated areas in the Southwest, and the success of the mine accelerated Arizona's bid for statehood. However, after just a few short years, the gold dried up and the place was abandoned. But during its height, over 5,000 people lived in Vulture City. And when the gold and greed are flowing, that's gonna attract dangerous people looking for a quick score. There was so much violent crime and corruption in Vulture City that the United States Army was called in to keep the peace. They weren't able to. Instead, justice was meted out by vigilante citizens. And there was no worse crime in Vulture City than stealing gold. If you were caught, you got done strung up on a hanging tree. Dozens of Vulture City's worst were hung from the ironwood tree that still stands today. If you met your end at the hanging tree, you did not merit a burial in the cemetery. Your body was buried on the spot. Bodies that are still feeding that tree today. Vulture City was a place where a few made a fortune, but many suffered and died. Men, women, children, violence was common, as was illness. Hundreds of bodies are supposedly buried, not just in the cemetery, but all around the town. Oh, did it just get cold in here? Mm. The reports of cold spots, eerie voices, disembodied spirits have attracted ghost hunters from all over the world. Some say workers who were buried alive can be heard screaming and trying to claw their way out of their rocky tomb. If you're in the Phoenix area, you can take a guided tour of Vulture Mine or you can explore on your own. Links below. Ohio State Reformatory. The Ohio State Reformatory, also known as the Mansfield Reformatory, is a historic prison located in Mansfield, Ohio. It opened its doors in 1896 as a true reformatory. It emphasized incentive over punishment. Inmates were admitted for 18 months. They were given education. They were taught a trade and they were released. This model had a very high success rate and most inmates went on to lead productive lives. So you know, this whole thing's gotta go pear-shaped. OSR was originally supposed to house 2,000 inmates, one per cell. But by 1934, the prison was so overcrowded that they had two and sometimes three prisoners per cell crammed together. When you put dangerous people in close quarters, deprive them of food and exercise, you create a recipe for violence. According to the prison's website, just as animals in the wild had to learn to adapt and survive in their surroundings, so did the occupants of the OSR. Shanks, shivs, and all kinds of improvised weapons were found in every crevice of the cells. Fun fact, if this prison looks familiar, that's because it is. Shawshank Redemption was shot at OSR. In the description, I'll link you to a video that shows all the different filming locations. If you're a fan of the movie, it's a must watch. And things at OSR just got worse. In the 1960s, it was converted into a maximum security prison to house the most dangerous criminals in the state. Violence escalated, and in those dark years, over 200 people died at OSR. Guards, staff, and inmates. Life at OSR was so frightening that inmates often took their own lives. Others tried to escape. Some even succeeded. Lester Eubanks was sent to OSR in 1965 for crimes so heinous, I won't repeat them here, but I'll link below for those of you that are into gruesome stuff. Anyway, Eubanks escaped custody in 1973 and hasn't been seen since. He's still on the US Marshals' top 10 most wanted list. By the 1980s, the conditions were so bad that the inmates got together a class action lawsuit and sued the state of Ohio for putting them through brutalizing and inhumane conditions. They won the suit. The prison closed. Want it? You bet your flippers it is. There are reports of doors slamming, people being pushed, scratched, equipment being turned on and off. And these stories drew a lot of interest from the ghost hunting community who consider it one of the scariest places on earth. Now, if you want to check it out for yourself, OSR offers all kinds of different tours, historical and paranormal. They host private paranormal investigation tours. They even teach ghost hunting classes. And if you want to be truly petrified, you need to sign up for the Escape from Blood Prison Experience, where your goal is to escape while being chased by actors dressed as guards, prisoners, and ghosts. At least I hope they're actors. The Mineral Springs Hotel. Alton, Illinois is known as the most haunted small town in America. And the focal point of this spiritual disturbance is the Mineral Springs Hotel. When the Mineral Springs Hotel and Spa opened in 1914, it was spectacular. Five floors of luxurious accommodations, a marble staircase, and the largest swimming pool in the state. A natural spring was found on the property and the water had a high sulfur content, which gave it kind of a funky smell. Well, an enterprising chemist said that that water had magical healing properties. 
and naturally, before you know it, they're shipping hundreds of bottles a day of sulfur water all around the country. That's a lot of diarrhea. The hotel eventually declined and fell into disrepair, like all of us. But in 1978, Mineral Springs was renovated and now contains an antique mall, some offices, apartments, even a horror museum. Even though Mineral Springs was a famous luxury hotel, it's now really famous for being a paranormal hotspot. One of the staircases is a specific focus point. The story goes that a young woman brought a man to her room, a man who was not her husband. But the husband got back to the room early and found his wife and another guy, uh, how do I say this without getting in trouble on YouTube? In flagrante delecto. Right, that. So an argument ensued and spilled out into the hallway. Now, we don't know if it was an accident or if she was pushed, but the wife died at the bottom of those stairs. Now, investigators say that they can smell jasmine in the hallway. She was wearing jasmine perfume when she died, and that ghost is now known as the jasmine lady. And ghosts are all over this property. In the bottling room, people have reported seeing the figure of a tall, slender man, and the lower levels contain the swimming pools where multiple people had drowned over the years. And some of those deaths are actually recorded and verified. During a recent tour, wet footprints were found, even though the pool has been drained for years. The pool room doors have been known to open and close on their own, and many tourists have described hearing and feeling someone's breath on their neck. Yikes. Fort Delaware State Park. Fort Delaware is a fortress on Peapatch Island in the Delaware River. Originally built to protect Wilmington and Philadelphia, it became infamous as a POW camp for Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. 33,000 soldiers were in prison there, and almost 3,000 of them died from dysentery, scurvy, smallpox, and they're buried in a mass grave in New Jersey. Eh, that explains the smell. The man in charge of Fort Delaware was General Albin Schuff, who became known as General Terror. With thousands of prisoners kept in makeshift wooden barracks, the conditions were horrible. Bed bugs, lice, and vermin infested the buildings. Food rations were tiny and inedible. Decaying bodies and human waste caused the water to putrefy. These men were starving and dying of thirst. A favorite game of the guards was called rat call. This is where rat holes were flooded and then the rats were caught and killed. A guard would yell rat call and then toss the dead rats into the crowd. And according to an inmate's diary, the prisoners scrambled for the rats like squirrels boys for apples. He goes on to say that the rats were cleaned, boiled, and then fried. Their flesh was tender and not unpleasant to the taste. That's a dude who is starving. The diary is from Captain John S. Swan, who was captured in 1864. He chronicles the terrifying daily life as a Confederate prisoner of war. It's fascinating reading. Link where it is. For Civil War history fans, Fort Delaware is an incredible place where daily life is recreated. But the real draw to Fort Delaware? Ghosts. With so much death and suffering, it's no wonder that Fort Delaware is considered one of the most haunted places on Earth. Ghost tours are given all the time, and you could even enjoy an escape the island experience. Visitors claim that ghosts can be seen on a daily basis. In the dungeons, halls, and rooms, voices can be heard. Photographs have been taken that show everything from orbs of light all the way up to what seem like ghostly figures. There's also the story of a nine-year-old drummer boy who tried to escape the prison by hiding in a coffin. The escape failed. He was buried alive. And the story goes, he still haunts the grounds, playing his drum and crying for help. Waverly Hills Sanatorium. The Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Louisville, Kentucky, is a highly active paranormal investigation site. Waverly Hills opened in 1910 to treat tuberculosis patients, but by 1911, they were overflowing and they had to build tents to accommodate all the new patients, thousands of them. It's been estimated that 64,000 people died at Waverly and their bodies are buried on the property, but there are no headstones. We don't know where the bodies are, but I promise you that they're down there somewhere. So many people died at Waverly Hills they had to use something that they called a death chute, which was a tube-like tunnel that they would use to haul packages and groceries and supplies up, shoot bodies down. The death chute is reported to be haunted by those who made their final journey through the tunnel. Definitely worst roller coaster ever. Another haunted area is room 502, which is designated for nurses. One of them hanged herself in there. Another jumped out a window. Another went in there and never came out. She's just gone. 502. Go for it. And there are ghosts of children named Bobby and Mary that reportedly roam the halls searching for their mommy. What do you think, Doctor? Are you my mommy? That's creepy. 
In the early 1960s, Waverly Hills was converted into a nursing home, but it was eventually closed in the 1980s for, you guessed it, patient abuse. Jeez, this thing is like a ghost-making factory. Waverly Hills became known outside the area when it was profiled on the TV series, Scariest Places on the Earth. Since then, it's become a popular destination for paranormal investigators. According to the Waverly Hills Historical Society, guided tours and overnight stays are available, but you need to book over a year in advance. If you want to visit, I've got a link below. Thanks for hanging out with us today. My name is AJ. That's Hecklefish. This has been The Y Files. Do you know of any scary places that are open to the public? Put them in the comments section so we can check them out. We work really hard on these videos for you, so if you enjoyed them, kindly do us a favor and give us a thumbs up. It really helps out the channel. If you're new here, I hope we earned your subscription today. But if we didn't, I promise we'll keep making fun, brainy content until we do earn it. Until next time, be safe, be kind, and know that you are appreciated. Yeah.